Okay. Now let me go ahead and see if I can move this back over and make this work a little bit better. We're just gonna go through uh, for a couple of minutes here, um, talk about business continuity plans and disaster preparedness. I thought that this was a timely topic uh, given kind of what we are facing relative to the coronavirus, but it's really not pertaining to the coronavirus at all. It just made me think that we probably should have some conversation about uh, business continuity plans and why we need a plan. So I, I wanted to start off and I'm gonna record this so this will be posted on Canvas later on, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some true accounts that I've experienced in my career. Uh, one, I'll start off with um, something that has nothing to do with business. It's a personal experience that I had. Um, many, many years ago, um, I was a pretty um, uh, avid sailor and sailed offshore quite a bit. And um, at, at the time, uh, we were sailing back, uh, I don't know where we were, out off of Point Loma, a number of miles we used to sail you know, quite a bit out there. And at one point, uh, I just dropped, a, you know, a life jacket over the side of the boat and said to my wife at the time, it's not my current wife, it's my ex-wife, but I said that was me. And I sat down and I didn't do anything. And she got very, very upset with me. And, and I just says, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm gone. And so she ultimately figured out what to do, brought the boat around, picked up the life jacket and, and that. And every once in a while after that, for the next year or so, occasionally I would do that. I would just drop the life jacket over the side and say, I'm gone and sit down. Well, um, sometime later on, we were coming back uh, down the coast and we're offshore in some pretty heavy weather for sailing. Uh, pretty big swells and a lot of wind and uh, had a situation where I through really through my own error on a couple of counts wound up getting knocked overboard fully dressed no life jacket on water was very cold I think it was May maybe it was May um, I think the water temp was in the 50s and um, uh, so we, she had to execute um, getting the boat around and every time she tried to bring the boat up around she couldn't bring it through the wind and bring it back because um, actually a block had broken when I got knocked over but I got hit by the boom and she hollered out and the boom hit me here and threw me over the lifeline and I was in the water for about 20 minutes and ultimately was able to um, get out of the water and um, survived, but it was largely because of the fact that we had drilled that. And, you know, I've had other situations that I've been aware of. There was a, a large mortgage servicing company up in the Midwest that had a disaster plan for flooding because they were on the Mississippi River. And sure enough, the entire operation flooded and they had to execute their business continuity plan. I worked for a company where we were downtown San Diego. Uh, we had a business continuity plan, a disaster plan, if you want to call it that. And we had some recurring problems with um, electrical fires that were happening in the building. And ultimately, we executed that plan and moved, moved uh, out of the building on a temporary basis. Another example, I was working for uh, another bank. I was my operation was up here in the, by Palomar Airport when we had all the big fires and the fires got within a couple of blocks from us and we had to execute a plan at that point. So these are, these are situations that occur in real life. And so why do we want to plan? We want to plan because, um, you know, we're trying to avoid the manholes, right? We're trying to, we're trying to avoid falling in them. And I've always tried to tell people that big part of management is, you know, is looking out for the holes that you might fall into. And if you walk down a street and, you know, the manhole cover is off of the manhole and you see it there, you're not gonna, you're not gonna fall into it, right? And so 
you know, being a manager, you want to be contemplating what can go wrong and figuring out what's the plan if something like that does. And we're actually living in that situation right now for many, many, many businesses, uh, irrespective of the virus uh, concerns, but the impact of that on your businesses. So um, let's talk about what a business continuity plan is and a couple of the sections of that. Um, a business continuity plan is a comprehensive organizational plan that includes disaster recovery, and it generally has five major components to it. Business resumption, uh, occupant emergency, continuity of your operations, incident management, which is really an IT-related function, but we see situations like that where your company may get hacked or uh, you might be held ransom for access to uh, your own data. Uh, so incident management plans deal with that. And then disaster recovery. Um, what do you do if something goes bump in the night? So we're going to step through a little bit about these key steps here. And hopefully, um, hopefully this will be enjoyable to you. First of all, you got to start with what is a disaster? And that sounds so easy, but if you're writing a plan, if you think about it, it's actually very complicated. Um, the um, when I was in Texas, I was there for 20 years, um, and I worked for a bank that was out of um, the upper Midwest. And they asked us all to write disaster plans. All the divisions had to write disaster plans, and they defined what the disasters we were writing a plan for. One of the plans, uh, one of the items that we were writing a disaster plan for was volcanic eruption. I always chuckle about that because if you live in Texas, volcanic eruption is probably one of the least likely disasters you would encounter. But we spent a fair amount of time writing a plan like that because we were told that we needed to do that. So here's where you want to start. What are the most likely disasters or incidents that we might need to face um, that we need to be prepared for? In San Diego, it might be earthquake, right? It might be, you know, um, some disruption uh, with um, health issues like we're facing right now or with financial markets. So you want to be able to think about what are the things that would most impact our ability to stay in business. And keeping in mind that whenever we're trying to stay in business, we're also trying to protect our employees' jobs as well. So you want to define that. And in order to do that, you really have to kind of perform a risk assessment. You need to go through and go, what is the big risk that we face in our business that would not just impact us, but severely impact us? And then you want to figure out, all right, what, when is the plan? When should that kick in? So if we were looking at, say, in our, uh, let's say a fire in San Diego, and you might want to know, well, when should, a, when should that plan kick in? Well, clearly, if the fire is, you know, on your doorstep, you know, the plan is going to kick in. But, you know, but at the same time, if you think that you're going to be out of the building for two hours, that's one thing. If you think you're going to be out of the building for two weeks, it's obviously more difficult, right? So start with defining what your disaster is or the situation that you want to that you want to write a plan for and do a risk assessment. What can we live without? What, can, what do we absolutely need? What impacts our ability fundamentally to do business? Obviously, um, teaching and being students, we have to have communication with our students and with our instructors. And so being able to have connectivity is important. I do work for a couple of other companies uh, remotely and I don't know if you can see this, but I've got down here, it's just sitting here right now. I've got a, one laptop and there's another one up there for the two different companies that give me direct access into the company that I can work from my office here. In fact, I haven't been out of our house but one time in three weeks now. So um, I'm able to completely function and work and I'm actually working like five jobs right now. 
that's stretching it a little bit, but very busy, needless to say. So um, we, then once we do our risk assessment, we determine what's important to us, then we can talk about what are our alternatives, what are our options, and what are the protocols for that um, as far as getting our job done, clearly. Um, options for many people today, we figured out as well, some of our staff can work at home, but we will, for longer term outages, we need more people to be able to work at home, which means we need connectivity for those people. They need to have laptops for be able to connect into the, to, um, the computer systems, right? So you wanna be able to think about what your options and what your protocols are, and then you're gonna to need to establish priorities for those. You know, what's the most important thing that we do? We must be able to, you know, handle cash. We must be able to, um, maybe it's provide, you know, mailing statements to people. It depends on what your business is, but you're going to have to go down and think through what your business functions are. What's the most important thing to do in your business? In the mortgage servicing world, which a lot of loans are sold to, agencies like Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and Jenny Mae, there are remittances that are incredibly time critical. They have to happen on certain days of the month at certain times, uh, and it's imperative that they do because those monies ultimately get passed through to uh, reporting to bond investors. And so those would be a very, very key priority in that particular business. But the idea is that you're gonna to wanna to go through, right? And figure out what are the most important businesses or priorities, most important priorities for your business. And then once you do that, you wanna develop procedures and processes for it. It's just like writing procedures for your normal business, but it's much more abbreviated and it's much more focused. If we have an outage and we're out for out of the building for two days, what do we do? What happens if we're out there for two weeks? What happens if it's longer than that? Because for instance, if you had a fire and it, you, you have to evacuate today, okay, people that aren't critical, go home, stay safe. People that are critical, go home, sign into the computer because we're gonna, we gotta do some things. Um, if we're out for, two or three days, maybe we expand it. We try to get some of those staff to another location to work on a short-term basis. If the building burns down, obviously, or if it's really damaged with smoke or water sprinkler systems go on, then, well, now we gotta find another place. We, gotta, we actually have to kick in a whole nother set of processes to relocate our business, find space and move it and all that. So those are the sorts of things that you would do in developing your process and your procedures. Um, next thing you want to keep in mind is once you have your process and procedures and your plan, you want to document that plan, but you also want to make sure that you've got copies that are accessible. Um, and those copies would be um, kept offsite. At least some copies would be kept with key managers or key executives and they'd have those offsite. Part of that, one of the big functions is going to be that one of the second to the last bullet here is going to be a, a decision tree or contract uh, contact tree. When we had to evacuate in this one situation with the fire, um, it happened very, very quickly. We had to evacuate um, in, with very little warning and somebody had to make the decision. Well, we already knew who could make the decision. I was the on-site manager and then we had a facilities manager who was um, not at this location. Uh, we connected by phone to this the situation. We made the decision and we were part of our plan was that we could make the decision. Um, evacuate. Uh, the people that you know could work from home for the rest of the day were told go home sign in. The rest of you go home. We will communicate with you before the morning as to what we do. And we may have some of you go to another location or we may wait another day or we may have you all go to another location. And so later that day, we, we made a call, said, no, it looks good, come back into the office. But we were able to just seamlessly move through what we had already rehearsed in our mind and in our processes to do. Um, be clear with the authorities. Who can declare it saying evacuate? or who can't. And once you are in your executing your plan, who actually can make decisions? 
Uh, you know, a lot of companies actually don't have this documentary, and I think every company should. And that is a, um, a delegated authorities chart. Have something very clear. Well, who can sign checks for the company? Well, it doesn't vary by dollar amount. Who can hire and fire people? Who can, who can, um, you know, make purchases for the company? Up to what dollar amounts? Uh, does it require a single signature or dual signatures? So those are the sorts of things that you want embedded in your disaster uh, plan or your contingency plan. Um, last bit to talk about is um, test. Um, test it occasionally and update it frequently. Every year you want to make sure your contacts or information is good, people move, leave, so you can't just do this once and put it on the shelf. You at least have to pull it off the shelf at least once a year and take a look at it. So, okay, so what are the other, what are some of the benefits for this? Obviously, in my case, we had a disaster plan. We tested it. I didn't drown that day, right? It was a good thing. Uh, but also in the other situations, our businesses were able to continue to work. In the situations I mentioned to you earlier, they weren't catastrophic uh, disasters, but there were enough to interrupt our business and every day meant a lot of money to the company. So we were able to keep that moving pretty smoothly. And it also held down um, the lack of leadership um, that employees all look for. When there's a crisis, your staff always wants to know that you've got it as well in hand as you can. And that brings me to one thing that's not on our bullet point list, and that is effective communications. Managers really have to be able to clearly tell staff, this is what we're doing, this is the decision, go here, do this, or what is happening? Oh my goodness, we've got this horrible problem, but I don't want to tell you about it. So you need to be able to give information that is accurate, you want to give it often and you want to be sensitive to the the emotions that all staff are going through when there is any kind of a critical situation it might not have anything to do with health or fire or earthquake it might have to do with the financial situation and people get nervous about whether or not they're gonna have a job the next week so you want to be able to be communicative and be clear with your staff and they will appreciate that and hopefully they won't panic as well. They will execute the plan, which is exactly what we are all sitting back now, participating in some level, isolating, right? But we are also participating by um, doing what we all can do to get through this situation. And that's true with all of the business um, disaster or continuity plans that we you know, write and execute. So hopefully this has been helpful. Um, I'm going to take this off here and see if we have any questions. I don't think I see any questions. So I'm going to go ahead now and wrap this up. And I will transcribe this and it'll be posted out a little bit later. So hopefully um, you found it uh, interesting and we will talk soon. Bye-bye.